In our last video, we promised you a review of Comanauts, a storybook game that's not quite like the others. So here it is. The game that broke us and made us feel less like Mark Commode and more like Peter O'Hanrahanrahan of the board game world. Comanauts is special in everything from its presentation to its ambitious narrative structure to the fact that in our opinion, it is perhaps not a very good game. Didn't didn't you tell me you loved this game? Mm-hmm. But it's not very good? Mm-mm. How does that work? Curiously. In Comanauts, we're saving the world from a tiny singularity, aka miniature black hole, and the only way to do that is to take on the role of people who dive into a comatose scientist's psyche to wake him up. That alone would be enough for Christopher Nolan, but designer Jerry Hawthorne, famous for Mice and Mystics, is saying, do you know what? Let's add a few more layers. And by layers, he means pages of a book that when you play, you actually flip, and not only is there story, but you put your actual characters into the book. In his psyche, we take on the role of avatars, ranging from a cowboy, a burger chef, a lady with a gravity gun, Arno, who is really just Arno, and a sort of Vinnie the Pooh by a Toy Story. I can safely say that Pooh never looked so good. But wait, there's more. Not only do we have to navigate a dreamscape menagerie of weird locales, like a futuristic Starbucks, the Wild West, rooftop of a tech company, or an actual D&D adventure, but we also have to track down and fight a demon manifested from the most negative aspects of Martin's, that's the name of the scientist, subconscious. Surely you can love Comanauts for that alone. But what if I told you that this crazy parade of ideas and concepts is just the tip of the iceberg and there's so much more behind the curtain? What then? Then we've got you hooked and that buys us some time to dip into the rules. Under the covers, Comanauts is a dungeon crawler. Each avatar you control is your hero and each dreamscape you visit is a dungeon. At the start of the game, five of the 11 available locations will be chosen and will form the basis of your jaunt. Each of these locations has an ID tied to it, and when I say ID, I of course mean in a demon. For example, Plainsview, Martin's hometown, is associated with the ID of fear. And if you think your childhood memories would evoke more pleasant emotions, then might I remind you of such greatest hits as that time you got ill and they stuck a giant needle in you, and thinking about snakes every single day of your life. Snakes? Why did you think about snakes? Soviet childhood, Selene, it's really hard to explain. Certainly harder to explain than this game. One of these IDs will be randomly selected to be the prime ID and your job is to find it and defeat it. When you start playing, you don't know which ID is the prime ID you just know that it's not the one in your starting location. So you'll hop from dream to dream, gathering clues about which location it is that you actually need to find, sometimes finishing entire locations, or sometimes visiting a glowing bunny rabbit that will let you jump through an interdimensional dream hole until you find the right location, finish it completely, and cure whatever is ailing Martin's broken mind. And, and somehow that all still makes sense. Each of these places, the childhood home, the comic book fantasy, there's a duality to them. They're puzzle pieces that put together form that broken mind. For example, you'll find characters in Martin's youth that you'll encounter later on in his life and you'll realize that they've become familiar and important to you. But these locations are puzzles themselves. Each one doesn't just introduce new rules and new ways to approach the game but is littered with challenges. Challenges that are not quite like in the Heroes vs. Monster games that you are used to. Okay, let's imagine an example. Say you're sitting in Martin's physics lecture, but Martin's physics lecture is a dungeon crawler. Now, can you imagine a scenario where one of the challenges is cribbing some homework? Ludicrous, I know. But you better imagine it because this one is real. When it's your turn, you'll dip into a bag of dice and much like a hit and run on a pick mix stand, you'll end up with a handful of delicious possibilities and licorice. Each white die will potentially add clarity, a universal token that can be spent on the oh-so-precious rerolls or even activating your avatar's uber-ultimate ability. 
Each black die will go on the threat track. Gather enough of these and you'll provoke an attack from Martin's mind's defence mechanisms and your dreamscape will erupt into fish head policemen chasing you down with lollipop batons. Landing bullets with your dead eye revolver or balancing on the precipice of a rooftop ledge requires green dice, whereas bashing anything with anything bashable requires red. Blue dice are good for protecting yourself and yellow will help you with braining the situation. I used to have a bachelor's degree in braining. Oh yeah? What happened? Here's the thing. This system has problems. Problems that make it hard for us to recommend commonants. But before we get into that, I'd like to tell you why we adore it regardless. From the tedious minutiae of world building in Detective to the predictable bland tropiness of Arkham Horror board games have bludgeoned one fact into us. When it comes to narrative they can really only do surface level stuff and even then with mixed results. Even our favourite game of all time Gloomhaven features a story that is just about serviceable and while certainly with quirk and charm it's just there to propel the game along. But what happens when you get a game with the story that is actually good. Through Comanauts, we get to see Martin's life, his friends, lovers, hardship, frailty and hope, and through Martin we get to see ourselves. It would have been also oh easy to call Comanauts a mashup of Inception and Ready Player One and then just be done with it, but that would be reductive. Thankfully Mr Hawthorne understands that that's just the surface level, which has been handled expertly with bright colours and imaginative characters and surreal twists on familiar locations, but delve deeper and you'll find the real human being whose experiences are universal and therefore relatable. When we explore Martin's life, we see ourselves in him. A location might start as pure escapism only to realise that what you're actually exploring is a medley on how escapism affects us, how we plunge into it avoiding facing life crashing events and how they eventually catch up with you no matter what. By the end, I could barely stop myself from bawling my eyes out. In fact, even just thinking about it, I... Oh God! Crying, huh? Yes, it's very sad. What's that in your lap? What? Oh, no, that's that's just tissue. Don't lift worry it. about it. What? Lift it. I said lift it. I thought so. Comanauts is not the first game to try and tackle a serious narrative. This war of mine and holding on the troubled life of Billy Kerr have taken on the challenge before and the latter one shares a lot of beats with today's subject. But whereas those felt like brutes sent to beat you down with a club of misery, this one has no interest in holding your empathy hostage. It just wants to tell a person's story and hopes that that is enough. And it is. Efka, will you put that onion away? Crucially, I want to tell you so much more about the story in Comanauts, but I fear I'm already in the territory of coming across like a pretentious twit, and really I'd rather leave you to discover it for yourselves. But that is the question, should you discover it for yourselves? After all, we did say that the system in this game has problems. It does, but it also does a lot of things right. The rules are simple and keep the game going at a brisk pace once you get to grips with them. Once again, no thanks to the not so great rulebook from Plat Hat Games. Each new element it introduces in new scenes feels intuitive and there's some very elegant things happening when it comes to scaling for play accounts. Where it falls down, and this is key, is the core mechanism of drawing dice from a bag and those dice determining what you can actually do. Now, Chance is a very big sticking point here at MPI, but to be more precise, it's more about how chance is implemented. Let's show you an example. Say I'm fighting an angsty college student. If I want to bash them, I simply need to roll above the target number, and their anguished wailing is no longer my problem. The great thing is that if I want to, I can pull as many red dice as I've drawn together for a single roll to make sure that I get a high enough result. And even if I fail, I can use clarity tokens to re-roll them. The trouble is actually drawing the requisite dice. Far too frequently, we felt like we knew which story choice we wanted to make, but we couldn't actually advance in that direction simply because we couldn't draw the dice that would let us do the actions that would let us advance in that direction. It felt like the dice bag was making choices for us, and when it didn't, 
then the path was pretty straight and narrow. There's quite a few mechanisms in place to mitigate this, such as wild purple dice that serve as any color, the ability to save a die between turns, and even passing a die to another player. But even with all of these, we have somehow continuously found ourselves being stuck and constantly drawing and rolling, drawing and rolling, drawing and rolling. You can even exchange any two dice for a die from the discard pile, but as if to pour salt on the wound, the system constantly forces you to put dice back into the bag before you can make a meaningful swap. It felt infuriating. And I suspect that for some this won't be an issue. Some folks just want pure escapism from their games and that's fine, that's totally okay. As reviewers were so focused on measuring the quality of a game in terms of its mechanical fidelity. But with common arts, is that even the main concern? Well, it's okay for a game to have wonky mechanisms if your game is spinning a good tail, as long as those mechanisms don't get in the way of the spinning. What's worse is finding layers and meaning in that yarn, only to be defeated by a series of frustrating, unfortunate events and having to go back and replay that yarn. Every time you play, your 5 out of 11 dreamscapes will be assigned randomly. And whilst you'll never have to revisit a place that has been designated as the prime inner demon's domain, you might still venture into places that you've already fully explored, and within that, there's not much scope for new exploration. Each beat has a predetermined path that will make you feel like you're just retracing your footsteps. So we can't recommend Common Arts, can we? But I really want to. The story isn't just good, it's the best story I've seen in any board game. And second place isn't even close. Okay, so how about we compromise? We recommend Common Arts, but with the caveat that the gameplay will most likely frustrate you. But perhaps that doesn't even matter. A recommendation, if ever I heard one. Oof, so close, but I don't feel like Common Arts quite cut the mustard. But I'll tell you what, if you do enjoy a good mustard, or just a good board game review, then you should subscribe to our channel. Not only will you find a plethora of previous board game reviews, but also, if you feel like we've been a little bit on the negative side lately, you'll be very pleased to find out that next time we will feature a board game that was our game of the year for 2018. Isn't that something?